the Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really looked forward to. He is the hardest working person on YouTube, maybe the planet. <laughs> His name is Meet Kevin, and he is just an awesome guy. Kevin, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thank you so much for having me, George. This is super exciting. I, I, I can't believe I get, I get to be part of the Rebel Capitalist Show. I, I watch your show. I think it is amazing. And thank you so much for the invite. I appreciate the kind words. I want to start with going over your backstory. A lot of your viewers know it well, and I've heard it quite a few times. But for some of my viewers and listeners, I think they would just be fascinated to hear how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's it's uh it's been a journey. It's so weird looking back now that this this decade is is this last decade is gone. So much has changed. Now we're in this new decade. It started out a little funny, but uh, yeah, it it all really started with uh sales. Yeah, me working at Jamba Juice, you know, making eight bucks an hour, getting like a five to a five cent raise, and being frustrated. Like, how am I supposed to get ahead? Making minimum wage was was my frustration, and I thought maybe I could get a second job, but then I'm like, then I'm working all the time, uh, which is kind of ironic because now I literally work all the time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, it started with with uh, sales because I, I decided to get my real estate license. My girlfriend's uh, uh, parents were in real estate; they were retiring from real estate, and I thought, oh well, if my girlfriend's gonna get a real estate license, I, I'll get my real estate license. What else am I doing? You know, I was going to right. school for four hours a day in high school and Jamba Juice, and I'm like, oh, whatever, I'll get it. This is when you were in high school. It started when I was in high school. I, uh, f you know, signed up for my licensing that summer, and uh, uh, my first year of college, I finally actually got my license. But uh, yeah, when I first got my license, it it started with if I'm going to make money selling real estate, I got to know the product, and and there's no better way to know the product than to buy and use what you sell. <laughs> so I'm like, I guess I'll go buy some real estate. And that's how it started. That just happened to be 2011, which happened to be really amazing timing. So how did you get your money to do your first deal? Yeah. So Lauren and I had each saved up uh, somewhere between eight to nine thousand dollars each. And that was all from minimum wage jobs. Uh, wow. And so we yeah, just saving. Oh, and Apple stock. I will say there, there was some Apple stock credit in there. Whatever I made at Jamba Juice, I threw into Apple. Okay. It was like the Tesla of the day, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, so so then we together had around that 20K and we found a house for 300 grand after it took us about four months of looking to find something that that really was like, okay, yeah, we should do this. And and even when we wrote the offer, then we're like, I, I don't know, I don't know, this, this we don't have a lot of money. Like we barely make 1,900 bucks a month together at our minimum wage jobs and our payment was $1,900. <laughs> So we're going into a situation where we were literally going to have 100% of our income go go to this property. Uh, so, of course, we couldn't qualify. Uh, Co-signed on an FHA 3.5% down loan with my father, who mm, had okay. no debt and income. Uh, he went on as a 1% owner, 49% me, 50% Lauren. Obviously, I found the deal. It was our idea to buy the deal. You know, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, daddy co-signed. Like, Dude, you gotta do what you gotta do to 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 right. get out get out from zero. You know, you don't want to be stuck at minimum wage forever. And uh, yeah, that's that's really what started it. We uh, bought that place. Uh, one of my first clients lent me twenty five grand so I could fix up the place. I got a renovation loan from the bank, but they want you to do work and then request draws, and it takes like six months yeah, to do yeah. all that crap. Yeah, yeah. So one of my clients lent me twenty five grand because he's like, "No, that's a good deal. I'll just put a second on the property and, and just pay me back, and you know, pay me a couple points." And I'm like, "Sure, <laughs> you know, five hundred bucks, but I get twenty five grand. Let's do it." And yeah, yeah. yeah, that's where it all started. So what I want to point out here to the viewers is you were, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were a real estate agent for a while. You're kind of learning the ropes. You're understanding the comps. You're becoming what I would call a local expert. And you got that, that um, kind of that information. You, you got that experience to where you could go out and start looking for a deal. And you could tell that, hey, this is a bargain or I'm going to make money on the buy side or this is overpriced. So many people go into this and just try to get gung-ho about real estate or investing or whatever, and they're not an expert, they don't have an edge, but but you had an edge going into this. There, there's no doubt, and, and that's something I didn't mention. Thank you so much for bringing that up. This, it was, it was such a no-brainer when we looked at it. We still had a hesitation because we were broke. 
but right. the deal itself was a no-brainer. We're looking at this place listed for two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars, bank foreclosure, no kitchen, no bathrooms, and uh, the comps in the neighborhood were like three ninety to four twenty-five, and we're like, okay, that's a no-brainer. There were even some four fifty comps. It was incredible. Right. Uh, you know, by the time we fixed it up, it was all brand new fixed up. We were probably in line with those 425, 450 comps. And we're like, wow, we spent 50K on a place that's now worth way freaking more than what we paid for it. We were yeah. even up against cash buyers, which uh, I think the only reason we got it is because uh, it was a Bank of America foreclosure and they wanted to prioritize home buyers. I still paid mm -hmm. more than the cash buyers, but I think both of those things factored in. So did you turn that into a rental property? It's a rental now. Yep, yep. It's actually coming up for its uh, second re-rental, uh, I think, uh, at the end of this month. So it's it's going to be weird going into that property again. So what, what if you don't mind me asking, what type of rent are you getting per month gross on that? Yeah, it, uh, not great. <laughs> I think it's like 2900 bucks, something like that. And but, it's probably worth like 700 grand now. <laughs> yeah, but out of pocket, out of pocket, it's actually not too bad. I'm mean, like, how much do you have total out of pocket on that thing? Oh, probably uh, 25. Uh, I've refinanced since then and pulled money out. So all in property taxes. You know, the basis of, for taxes is low. But yeah, it's probably, you know, if it cash flows, it's maybe, you know, 300 bucks, something like that. Right. But I'm, I'm thinking about from a cash standpoint, if you, let's say you bought the property for, you said 300, was it? 305 is what I paid. 305. For. And then you put 50 into it. So let's just say if you would have paid cash, you got 350 in it and you're making about uh, $3,000 a month. So it's it's not what I would consider a 1% RV ratio, but it, it's pretty darn close. Okay. So I don't want to get too sidetracked there. I just wanted to point that out for the viewers because that's uh, a point that I always make is you, you've got to be a local expert. You've got to have an edge. So once you got done with the real estate stuff, how did you kind of parlay that into YouTube? What Or why did you start going into YouTube? Right. So it, it all started with that house. And it's so weird because what I used to do, and this is just crazy, uh, we we renovated that place as like an Ikea house, uh, Ikea kitchen, Ikea closets, yeah. Ikea beds, <laughs> furniture, like it's an Ikea house. Yeah, yeah. And so we would invite clients to the property uh, who, because there were so many fixer uppers on the market in 2011. It's like, Everything was a fixed rubber and everything was for sale. Uh, and, and there were a lot of people who were originally like us who were really fearful about investing in real estate. Uh, and I'm like, no, no, you know, like I went into it as a total idiot. Uh, this is what I turned. This is what the property looked like. Obviously, I had before and after photos. This is what I turned it into. This is what I spent on it. This is where I got my stuff. These are the painters I used and people I used. And, and when I would do that, I'd talk to people at either open houses or, or they'd want to meet for coffee to see if I could be their realtor or whatever. I would sit there and I used to have like a, a whole presentation that mm. was probably like 50 pages long. And I would sit down with home buyers or potential home sellers and we would talk, you know, the fastest would be like an hour and a half. The, right. Some people would talk to me for like four hours. And I would basically just teach them everything I knew about real estate. Some of them would just use a different agent, and then I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> like, but uh, but you know, obviously, a lot of people ended up using me. Uh, but it, it was really that excitement about, hey, come to my house. Let me show it. Let me show you what I did. Let me show you how to find a wedge deal. Let me show you how to find something below market value. That's that excitement then turned into, oh, there are people on YouTube in 2017. I thought about this. There are people on YouTube talking about this stuff. Well, if they could talk about it, I could talk about it on YouTube too, because that's what I do every day. <laughs> right. So, so when you were at these meetings, basically using digital marketing words, you were getting people to know you, like you, and trust you. That's how oh, yeah. you're building yeah. a, a clientele base. And what and I, I did that by providing value. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. And so you just thought, well, I can just do this on YouTube as well, and maybe this thing can scale. So what I want to point out to the viewer right here is, number one, you've got someone with an incredible amount of ambition, first and foremost a fantastic work ethic and then you've got someone that's going out there that's realizing that if they provide value to the free market they're going to get rewarded and you provide that value by getting a group of people to know you like you and trust you i just i just want to make sure we're pointing that out. okay next so we go into youtube and uh, i've watched some of your earlier videos i think they're all fantastic but you just kept you just kept trying you just kept throwing stuff up against a wall and seeing what sticks. And you had, I think, yep. a Graham uh, Stefan video, who's now, I think, a good buddy of yours that you did that kind of blew up the channel. But you just kept trying different things in almost every single video. And walk me through that process. 
Yeah, it was nuts. I mean, my first YouTube videos were my uh, the first YouTube videos I ever posted. Some of them are, are, are unlisted uh, right now. Some of them I should honestly just make public again because I think they'd be hilarious. But back in like 2011, I, I would make these videos and I'd, I'd put them on my website because they were just questions that people would always ask me like, well, how come you don't work for like a Remax or Keller Williams? So I would make videos explaining that. Uh, and I would put those videos on my website. They got like 100 views, right? It was just whoever went to my website, it's like, oh, let's see Kevin doing this. And I found the people were really like when I would go to those coffee meetings, people were like, Kevin, I loved it when you were in that one video, you're at the open house and you're cleaning the windows. Like that was so cool. Or, or, oh, that's so funny. You did this. And I realized people were like entertained by these videos. And this was common. Right. Like I would pass yeah. out flyers in neighborhoods and people were like, oh dude, I, I saw your video on your website. It wasn't, I saw you on YouTube. It was, I saw your video on your website. So that's how it started. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so I realized the videos were a great way for people to kind of get to know me before they got to know me. <laughs> There you go. Uh, and, and it grew no, from you there. Like trust you. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly through video. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and so when when I would go to these these coffee meetings, people are like, "Oh, I feel like I already know you." And this was I had twelve subscribers. Like nobody subscribed or found me on YouTube. It was all through the website. It was only when Graham uh, started talking real estate, and and I found him. You mm. know, summer of seventeen or whatever it was. I'm like, wait a minute. I can I can comment on some of these things and, and that's kind of how how like okay wow you could actually get viewers from YouTube happen because after I posted a video talking about him what Graham Stefan isn't telling you uh, uh, I which was a positive video but uh, yeah I, I posted the video and I'm like whatever not thinking anything because well I've been posting videos for years and I get 100 views and whatever uh, and I come back and all of a sudden it's like instead of 12 subscribers it's at like 988 I'm like oh my gosh what's happening yeah yeah, so what I want to point out here for everyone is, number one, persistence. You, you As an entrepreneur, or regardless, if, if you want to be successful in life, you have to be persistent. And then once you find something, you've got to continue to iterate because you're never, ever going to get it right the first time. Never. And what so many people do is they get the paralysis of analysis or that before they even start, before they pull the trigger, they're just trying to plan out the next 10 years. It's like, yeah. forget that. Just get yeah. up and take action for heaven's sakes. I always say you just shoot first and ask questions later. And that's, that's exactly- funny. My father-in-law, he, uh, he has a saying, uh, he says, there are a lot of ready aimers. And uh, he, he gives the analogy of, all right, ready aim. Oh, I can't do it. Ready, aim. Oh, I can't do it. And it's just, it's just shoot already. Do something. Yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> that's right. Because the only way you're going to find out what to do is if you shoot, make mistakes, see what the audience actually wants, and then respond to that. So take me through the transition because that was your first big video. But then you started talking about uh, uh, Greg Cardone and you did, <laughs> I mean, you started doing like some, some edits that in uh, back, back during when I first started watching your videos, I had my own uh, TV show in Medellin, Colombia, and so I and I I was the executive producer. I produced it. I directed it. I was actually in many of the episodes. So I was watching what you were doing by yourself editing. I was like, okay, well this this kid gets it. He really no. gets editing and, and making uh, transitions to keep the viewer engaged, and uh, some some technical stuff there. But my point is you're at, you were going all over the place. You're trying to make like short films. You were just <laughs> doing everything. So was that intentional to where you would look at your back end analytics and do what I'm talking about, where the, the more retention you would get, you'd be like, OK, that works. Let me do more of that. And then it's just that. What is it? The Pareto distribution where, you know, you're getting a 20 percent of your videos are getting 80 percent of the results. So you just do more and more of those. Right, right. Uh, a little bit of both. So it, something that I, I actually haven't talked about before, I'll just mention it here, is I had another uh, channel back in 2015, and it was just a family channel. It was just us posting, like, vlog videos. And so we we had watched a lot of vloggers, and, and so I got a lot of my editing style from those original videos from, from what vloggers do, the transitions oh, okay. and the retention. So a lot of that came from... I think we did uh, 120 days straight of vlogs every day, uh, us traveling to Paris or whatever, and uh, that was like a an amazing crash course in in YouTube because mm-hmm. even even though the videos didn't get a lot of views, 
I, we we were very well versed in okay how to film out and about how to how to edit cut together and and how to tell a story. What changed with the real estate channel is I injected rather than just having that entertainment factor, I also injected the the value right the real estate education value and. Right. That's when I started realizing it wasn't really all the crazy editing. It was the value that drove the views. And so you kind of see this transition. Now, now you can kind of almost have like this whole chain of went from just pure entertainment and, and edits and all this crazy vlog stuff to injecting education and edits, and those do great, to now almost just solely education and almost no editing. And, yeah. and that seems to be what drives uh, the most attention is, is value. But it seems you took a crisis and turned it into an opportunity. And this is another lesson that I want everyone to understand, whether you're young, old, aspiring entrepreneur, investor, whatever it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> when we had the, I call it the cervezas sickness, just to be <laughs> yes. friendly, you know, uh, when, when that happened, all of a sudden, I, I would have, you're, you're going to each one of your properties, you're doing all of these, uh, you know, kind of vlog type value videos. And now all of a sudden, boom, you can't do that. You're locked in your house. So you're like, oh, crap, what do I do? And so then you you transition. And this is something that every entrepreneur has to realize that you're going to come to a point where you've got to be a great problem solver. And yeah. so what I did, I, I kind of noticed your channel. You started making these videos kind of like more news videos, like two to three times a day. And ironically enough, that that that's when your channel really, really blew up. And you just, yep. again, you, you turned lemons into lemonade. So um, can you walk us through that? Because I think that's just a great lesson and inspirational for everyone. Yeah, well, thank you for that. It's it's something where uh, one of the things that I always recommend is, is and it's exactly along the lines of what you said, which is shoot and see what works. And so if you put 10 videos out there and one of the videos you put out there took 15 hours and you're going from the bushes into rental properties <laughs> and under sinks and nasty bathrooms and stuff oh, and oh, and you know you put 15 hours of work into that and it gets 18,000 views and then you do a video that's like holy crap look at what just happened or what Trump just did or what by whatever right and, and that gets 200,000 views it's pretty obvious what the audience wants at that right. point. Now, that now, there is going to be an audience that misses just, just the real estate stuff. stuff. But, but uh, uh, and, you, you know, know, I still, I still try, to provide, try to provide that content. That content but, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can be, be stupid not, not to try to provide both, both <laughs> sense yeah. value. Yeah, but it all goes back to kind of your core, and, and that's just helping people with their personal finances, whether that's through yeah. real estate investing, stock markets, uh, you know, stimulus checks, whatever it, it goes back or credit cards. It's about helping with the personal finances. OK, so I think we, we got up to speed on where you are now. And um, and for I won't go into the details. I've watched a couple of your videos on how well you've done financially. But Kevin is is absolutely crushing it right now. Oh. So I think you're still under 30 or did you turn 30 already? Uh, 28, it's turn, turning 29 this month. Okay, so Kev Kevin is just absolutely knocking the ball out of the park uh, from a financial standpoint. Seven figures, I mean, he's he's really, he's making it rain for sure. So we, we've got up to speed now. Now I think everyone loves drama, like you and I know. And so let's go into a little bit of a, a debate, a friendly debate. There's a couple points where you and I might disagree. So let's kind of discuss that here for a moment. The first would probably be California real estate. Uh, you're probably bullish. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely bearish on California real estate. But let's hear your argument. Why are you bullish? Uh, why do you see a rosy future for, and obviously it's, it's location, 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 but just from a, a broad standpoint, California real estate, or is it maybe more Southern California? Yeah, uh, it, look, California yeah. governance okay. sucks. Uh, the taxation is ridiculous. The rent control rules are ridiculous. Uh, to me, unless you're living in a part of California that has a natural draw to where people say, I will pay the extra taxes and deal with the extra red tape to live there, then I don't think it makes sense to invest there. Like for me, that that would be 
uh, yeah, Southern California coastline real estate is a great example. It, it, Santa Barbara, San Diego, these areas will always attract buyers who want to live there because you can only get that weather in 7% of the world and you know only 2% of that is in America. Uh, so that that's a natural draw that, that you can't have anywhere else. Uh, outside of those areas, yeah, I mean, like maybe San Francisco, but recently, you know, I almost bought a place in San Fran and I'm glad I didn't now. <laughs> All right, guys, so we had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we are back. So, Kevin, why don't you start right where you left off? You're telling us about that San Francisco home that you decided not to buy. Yeah, well, I lost the deal. <laughs> I really okay. wanted the thing. Would have been the biggest purchase of my life. It was uh, three and a half million dollars. I wrote an offer at the end of January, flew out there. It was one of the painted ladies, uh, those, those seven houses there in the row uh, that you always okay. see. In like so this full is like an iconic property. Very iconic. And it was the middle one, which had a view of the San Francisco Capitol, the best view. Uh, honestly, I, just talking about it now, I still miss it. But, you know, two weeks after I would have closed escrow, <laughs> you know, the pandemic locked down California. And I would have been screwed sitting on that thing for a year with uh, some pretty nasty payments. So I'm, I'm very grateful that did not work out in that sense. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so... Obviously, San Francisco real estate prices, I'm sure they're going to go through their little fix here, uh, along with uh, like New York City and that. But generally, high quality areas with with, uh, you know, either an increasing population or a decreasing poverty rate. I'm pretty bullish on uh, as long as they have a good draw. I do get nervous about certain real estate uh, where maybe the only draw is like one college or one church. And I'm like, well, what happens if they go away? You know, yeah. That makes me nervous. Yeah, Tucson is a good example of that, you know, I had my brother living in Tucson and I thought, man, with the, the pandemic now, I mean, the whole Tucson is built around U of A. Ah, so if okay. U of A goes and everyone's online, where are all the businesses? Where, where does all the real estate go? I mean, you really got a big problem there. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So what, any other reasons you're, you're bullish on the real estate right in your local area? The, probably the biggest reason beyond, uh, you know, buying in, in an area that, that should have a draw no matter what uh, okay. is you, when you buy in an area that you're living in, you're more of an expert in that area. You know, yeah. <laughs> like if somebody goes, hey, yo, Kevin, I'll uh, do this Craigslist deal, but I want you to come to, you know, one, two, three, whatever street. And I hear that street. And I'm like, heck no, I'm going there at 9 p.m. at night. You know, like <laughs> you only know that when you live there. Right. 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 <laughs> Yeah, and, and and I think your wife is your property manager as well, isn't she? That's right. Okay, so that is another huge edge because the hardest thing that I think uh, we all us real estate guys would agree, the hardest thing to figure out in real estate is property management. And, yeah, and finding so, a good manager. Yeah, it's well, it's like finding a great employee, right? <laughs> you know, you find a great employee, you got to do whatever you can to keep them. Uh, and and uh, yeah, well, same thing. Yeah, so so my my pushback there. I think where we see things differently is you, I think, maybe start with a bottoms up approach, which is natural, where I start with a, a tops down approach, just kind of looking okay. at the macro. So I look at California and I see, OK, well, we've got a lot of population leaving and a lot of affluent population leaving California. You've got the homeless rate that's increasing. You've got the, the political landscape that's just in a mess. You've got yeah. the electrical grid, who, who knows what's happening. But the bottom line is you, you see a lot of people exiting uh, California. And then I, I get a little apprehensive, especially with San Francisco, because yeah. I, I think that real estate market is really propped up by the stock market or the NASDAQ more specifically. Tech. And that's propped up by interest rates and the Fed and just a lot of central planning. And I thought, man, if we go back to a free market, if we ever do, uh, then that could, you know, and we had interest rates go up, let's say five or six percent Fed funds, then boy, that affects the the tech companies and may that affect. So that's why I'm kind of more bullish or excuse me, bearish on San Francisco. And you look at rates being in a 40 year down cycle, 5000 year lows on interest rates. And you say at some point they've got to go back up. And that's most likely, in my opinion, going to disproportionately affect uh, California real estate because it's kind of one of these cyclical markets where it goes up, it really goes up. And when it goes down, it, it goes down quite dramatically as well. Um, as far as the 
equity, see, this is something, but I think it goes back to having your wife as your property manager. And, and I love real estate, and I think the United States as a whole is overpriced, but if you are a local expert, if you can somehow find a motivated seller, if you can get that wedge deal and make money on the buy side, I think it still makes sense uh, with 30-year mortgage rates being as low as they are and you can fix them. And I want to talk about that a little later on. But um, I always thought, okay, if I had equity in California, like San Francisco, I'd far rather sell, extract that equity and put it into another market, which might have less downside and where I could get a better RV ratio, meaning the rent that I'm getting per month relative to the value of what I have out of pocket is a little bit better. But then I think to argue your point, you're going to have to deal with some property management issues. And uh, then the last thing that I'll say with California real estate is I really get hesitant when the the noob, let's call them, to, <laughs> to use yeah, your, I like that. is getting into a deal where they're not cash flow positive, where they have negative carry, where they have to, you know, the rents have to increase or they have to have nominal appreciation in order for them to realize uh, some sort of gain. I just get really, really kind of hesitant with that deal. So that's my pushback. Uh, meet Kevin, what say you? Yes. So uh, the California population leaving, that, that's an issue, right? That's definitely an issue. One thing that's very interesting that's happening, though, is as as we are seeing people leave California because they're either priced out or they're leaving for tax reasons, the poverty rate is also starting to decline in certain areas. And mm, so, okay. so you know, part of me is wondering, is is this just maybe now you, you get less people, but potentially a more affluent people who are like, I'm willing to pay that weather tax. Time will tell. Look, okay. L.A., San Fran, disaster with the homeless, right? I live in Ventura County, which is just below uh, Santa Barbara and above L.A. We don't have that issue as much here. Uh, we get a lot of people from L.A. coming to our area to escape that. So we're almost partially beneficiaries of that. Like, I want the weather, but I got to get out of L.A., oh, right? Okay. okay. Uh, so as we say, all real estate is local. Now, I personally, too, have uh, – and, and this is something that I've been torn between is uh, I've, I've many times thought, why don't I sell my portfolio and buy in a different state? Or another thing that I've recently thought is why why not sell the portfolio and then buy buy a hundred unit building somewhere, mm. uh, cost segregate that, take some massive tax benefits, yeah. and and uh, boom, it's all centralized in one building. Yeah. Uh, if I was going to do one of those two things, I personally would probably lean towards doing a big building because unless I'm local, I don't want to go chase down you know a hundred single families yeah, in a, yeah. in a state that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, now, if I buy big multifamily, though, I'm probably going to have to overpay. It's going to be much harder for me to get a great deal because there are so many funds looking for those big deals. The only way to get a, a smoking deal on a big multifamily is if I knew a private seller that somehow had hundreds of units sitting around and they were selling them for way below market value. But, you know, that's either partially striking the lottery or being an expert in your local area, which is another reason I like the local area because people do call you just yesterday, you yeah. know, an agent like, Hey, come look at this property. It's off market. You get to see it first. Uh, that's, that's great, but that's almost like a, taking advantage of, of special relationships more than it is making sense of the actual real estate. Right. Mm -hmm. So those, that is a dilemma that I'm in, uh, there, you know, I could 1031 the gains that I have in all these properties, but then I do pay selling fees. I hate paying selling fees. I hate right. the fact that all of the properties I have are rented and, and I would have to, you know, like incrementally sell them, but then I can't 1031. Right. Yeah, so right. it's almost like, am I better just borrowing a bunch of money, buying a big deal somewhere and then individually selling these guys off? I, I don't know. I, I'm in, I'm at this point now where you know, having, what do we have, 23, 24 properties, something like that in, in Southern California here, all here, uh, it's probably worth 20, 22, depending once once it's fixed up, a uh, million dollars in value. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at this place where I can't get 30-year fixed conventional, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac financing any, uh, anymore. And part of me is just like, why? I may as well just throw my money into Tesla. <laughs> you know, part of me feels that way. Yeah. But I still love real estate so much because it's such a great way to build your wealth when you're starting. And I think that's where I kind of draw that line and, the, and I say, look, if your net worth is certainly under a million dollars, you should start by buying real estate and putting three and a half percent down, getting into a deal. Uh, and in some cases, look, if you put anything less than tw – actually, probably most cases now, if you put less than 25 percent down, you're not going to be cash flow positive. You rent it out. Uh, and, and I've often seen that 
as the price for basically borrowing that extra 20%. It's still a problem because if you have to leave, you're upside down, you rent that thing out. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly some level of negative cash flow is very dangerous. But, you know, oftentimes when you, and it's just my opinion, but somebody gets in with three and a half percent down, let's say they're negative 300 bucks a month. That yeah. sounds like a big deal. But on a year, that's 3,600 bucks. So you're paying 3,600 bucks. How good of a deal are you getting? Are you able to get a deal that's 50 to 100 grand under market value after you spend your fix up money? So on top of that fix up money, right? Well, now you've just paid for 15 years of that negative, right? Now, obviously, there are more complications there. But the point is getting people into real estate lets them leverage up their wealth so much more quickly because now you put 3.5% down on a, on a place you got under market value. You're putting 20 grand in. Your net worth goes from 20 grand to 100 grand because you got a wedge deal. You know, your net worth balloons much faster. Now, appreciation on top of that, principal pay down. You know, it's, it's I think, a personal situation. Everybody's got a way out. I think that's a great way to say it. And I also want to point out in your defense, and correct me if I'm wrong, that during the GFC, there were pockets of the California the real estate market that really didn't go down that much, if, if, if at all, from 2006 to 2012. So I, I think it really emphasizes the, the point that where you have to be a local expert and every circumstance is different based on not only your skill set, but I think also the cash flow you have coming in outside of real estate, right? Yes. So yes. I, I, you know, I, I would argue that someone that's making a million dollars a year from their, their job or from their other investments or from their business uh, yes. is able to take a little bit more risk with a property that might be cash flow negative than right. someone who's making 50 grand a year as a school teacher. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely goes back to that. Okay, so I, I totally get where you're coming from there. Let's talk about the stock market. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think you're someone who really believes in the philosophy of buy the dip. So uh, if so, can you tell us why? And then I might push back a little bit. And then I want to circle back and then start talking about a lot of the things that we agree on. Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is the other reason that I have such issues selling my real estate is when this crisis happened uh, in March, I was standing in a property that I was closing on. And, and I remember literally feeling panicked. Here I am, you know, with at the time, like, you know, 10 properties or whatever, 10 or 11 properties. Uh, and uh, maybe, you know, I think at the time, 600,000 bucks in the stock market. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, everything's about to hit the fan. Like, this is a disaster. This is a crisis. And I remember that fear. And I remember thinking to myself, this is probably a good time to go buy some stocks. Because if I'm mm -hmm. feeling this way, I can only imagine how other people are feeling. That's right. And that led me to refinance as many properties as I could as soon as I could. And I used these properties, like that first one I discussed, I never refinanced it. I had never refined it. Uh, so I still had the original loan on there. So I had a crap ton of equity in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, as I say, I broke the piggy bank on as many of these little yeah. rentals as possible. Don't care if the cash flow goes down a few hundred bucks because I'm going to make way more money buying the dip was, was the, the theory. And so I plowed all this money into uh, into this, everything I refinanced. I plowed it all into the money and or into the market. Uh, March, April, May, refinanced some more properties, kept buying, and uh, then my income also went up. Uh, get more, you know, income from YouTube, uh, news related content, stimulus, news, politics, whatever, and um, took that money. Yeah, and also the the learn from home. I mean, everybody's like, well, I'm stuck at home. May as well like take a course or whatever. That obviously boosted course sales. And so I just took that money and just every time I got paid, I went shopping in the stock market. You know, what's what's suffering today? Oh, there's a stock that's down. Let's go buy some of that. And uh, that's that's really been uh, a lot of the uh, psychology over the last year. And, and now the portfolio has just exploded uh, for reasons of, of course, income going up. But also, I mean, who would have guessed that real estate would go up nationally like 12 percent over the last 12 months? Yeah, the stock market's good. obviously been ridiculous. So. No kidding. Okay, so I think the the difference there between our philosophies, because I bought a ton back in March as well. Right, yeah. just, I, I think I bought for a different reason. And so I was buying not necessarily because the market just went down. Um, I was buying because and I was buying select things that I thought were cheap and cheap based on their cash. So I always say I'm trying to buy 
a dollar for 50 cents instead of trying to buy a dollar for three dollars, hoping it goes to five dollars. Meaning I'm more of a right. value guy than yes. a growth guy. Did you buy the books or banks? Uh, I bought Wells Fargo in April a little bit, but what I really bought were the commodities. Okay. I, I bought I bought the oil producers, I bought coal, I bought uranium, I bought the, the gold miners, I bought a lot of these stocks that were just beat down. Were you getting uh, a discount on book value on these? Well, I I don't I'd have to go back and look at each stock to see the the actual financials. But what I was doing, I first started with the commodity, so I'd look at a long term chart of oil, let's say. So if you adjust it for inflation, I'd say okay, going back a hundred years, uh, oil when it gets below thirty dollars a barrel, it's, or it goes it's, negative, it, or <laughs> negative forty a barrel. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. It, yeah. It, it, it seems to be pretty cheap. It seems yeah. to always rebound and go back up. And then when you look at it getting above eighty dollars a barrel, that's when it starts getting a little bit expensive. So that's just kind of how I try to keep it simple: is say, okay, well. If it's under 30 a barrel, I want to be a buyer. And I'm just going to sit there and hold it until it gets over 80 a barrel because I believe that we're going to need oil for a little little while longer, especially with inflation oh, yeah. potentially coming. So I'm going to go out and just try to buy solid producers. Uh, I think I bought a bunch of Shell, and I might kind of parlay that into some other stuff overseas. But that's kind of the, the core strategy right there. So I get paid to wait. Because a lot of these uh, companies are paying good dividends, some of them decrease, but you're still getting paid to wait while oil goes back up if it does, or you take advantage of inflation, you're getting paid basically to short the dollar. Right. So that, that was kind of, and uranium was, was super, super cheap back then. Coal was wow. ridiculously cheap. So anyway, but see, I, I was buying things because they were cheap and um, not necessarily buying things just because they had gone down in price, you see. Okay. And mm -hmm. then, but also, but one thing we were doing the same there, and it goes back to one of my favorite investors, Jim Rogers. And uh, I first read about Jim Rogers in the Market Wizards books in the first interview he did with Jack Schwager in the late 80s. And mm -hmm. since I've, I've had the opportunity to interview him, but his, his philosophy was you always, you sell hysteria and you buy panic. Okay, and I write that one down. That's sell, ah, oh, okay. Okay. So you I like it. sell manias, you sell hysterias, and you buy panics. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. it's just when the, when emotion is at its peak, and I think that's what you did well back in. Uh, maybe we both did well back in March. Is is we bought the panic, right. and uh, I think that's maybe the, the the we came at it maybe from a different angle. Sure. But that, that, maybe that's the takeaway that most people can. Uh, th that's the value takeaway that most people can get from that example. It almost didn't matter what you bought at that point. You know? well, yeah. yeah, looking back in retrospect, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Okay, so now let's go into some stuff that we, we really agree on. And we're, we're both real estate guys at heart. One thing I really wanted to get your opinion on was how you see consumer price inflation playing out over the next, let's say, 10, 15 years. Do you think, and I, I, I kind of, separate it into uh, buckets, I compartmentalize it because, you know, we could see asset price deflation, inflation, we could see the dollar go up against the euro, you know, the DXY, those are all separate buckets. But as far as consumer prices, the stuff you buy on a daily basis, what's your opinion on inflation over the next five, 10 years? Right. Uh, every time I talk about CPI, I just want to first mention, I realize there, there are a lot of people that do not believe in government inflation data then. And it makes sense because, you know, the Economist report, the Economist magazine reported that 25% of all currency that exists was created in 2020 through yeah. stimulative effects, right, which right. that is insane, right? I mean, this, this explains why everything's just frothing up because there's so much money printing going on. And it's all digital money printing, obviously. But um, anyway, yeah, I mean, with with all of this increase in money, it, it would make sense that there would become so much more demand for products, and that would push prices up for products. But it almost seems like what we've created is this society that's more interested in saving and now investing which has substantially less, uh, you know, money supply volatility, or not uh, velocity, Velocity. Not volatility. The velocity of money is way lower for saving and investing, uh, and, and so potentially because people are taking all this extra created money 
and either saving it, paying down debt or investing it, maybe we don't get that, mm. uh, you know, product inflation that we would right. expect. It's, and instead, we just get the stocks going to the moon, basically, which it, it seems it's very, very weird. But, you know, if we look at what the Federal Reserve says, we know they don't see inflation coming until 2023, 2024. But, you know, they've been wrong before. So who knows? Yeah, right. Especially when you measure it. And, and then also it's an interesting dynamic when you not only think of demand, but when you think of supply of the goods and services. I mean, we're, we're forcing people to stay home right now and we're incentivizing them to stay home to a certain degree. So, you know, it, is the amount of stuff that we have in the United States, is that going to decrease? And even if you've got the same amount of currency units chasing it, could push up prices. It's an interesting dynamic. But I, the, the reason I wanted to bring this up is to talk about the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Yes. And I've been playing around with this idea in a lot of my videos that, you know, back in, in, in the good old days, before the Fed was intervening and we had all this central planning, you know, when we had more of a free market, you would look at the property that you just purchased as the asset and the right. debt, the mortgage would be the liability, right? Right. But now it's like the you know the prices of, of real estate are very very high, and a lot of people um, you know that aren't local ent- experts might be uh, overpaying, yeah. but they're getting this on like a thirty year fixed rate mortgage that's at three percent, let's say. So if <laughs> yes. they are cash flow positive, and if we do get a delta between the rate of inflation, say it runs at five percent and sure. their uh, interest rate is 3%, that's a transfer of wealth, purchasing power, from the lender to them, the borrower. So it's almost like we've created this perverse world where the property is the liability and, <laughs> and the mortgage is actually the asset. What, what do you yeah. think? I mean, what you're, what you're doing is it's, it's, like a, it's like a call option on interest rates here, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and and I would assume too that you know when you're talking about the amount of real estate that you own, oh now oh yet you actually took out uh, more. So now, how many of those properties do you have uh, a fixed rate mortgage on? Uh, probably. Let's see. I've got two short term notes, and the rest are all thirty year fixed. Wow. So, so two are short term that are probably I'm going to flip out of them. But yeah, the others are all thirty year fixed. That's incredible. So, so let me just for the viewer here, let me just walk through what, what Kevin's doing uh, from a macro standpoint it is he, he's basically going in, he's buying, he's making money on the buy side. He's getting a wedge deal, let's say, meaning he's buying it under the, the, the current market value. He's forcing appreciation three, through a remodel. He's increasing the amount of, of uh, ROI he's getting with his cash flow because his cost basis is a lot less than just going in and, and buying retail off the MLS. So he's got higher cash flow, most likely in his case, because he's an expert, a positive cash flow on most of his properties. So he's being paid monthly to short the dollar. Okay. Yeah. Because so if, when inflation, the cost of consumer goods goes up, the value of dollars goes down. So he's paying back, let's say, 15, 20 million dollars worth of loans in devalued dollars year after year after year. And that compounds, right? So you take it to its extreme. And let's say that in uh, 10 years, we go through ex- severe inflation, as hypothetically. And let's just say that, uh, just to take it to an extreme, a ridiculous extreme, yeah. let's say a loaf of bread, it costs a million dollars, right? We go. Sure. So then what Kevin could do is he would basically pay off those loans with what he would have paid at the local grocery store for a loaf of bread. But but those homes would most likely have a similar amount of purchasing power than when he bought them initially. Right. See, that's the transfer of wealth from the lender to the borrower. And um, I don't know whether you, you thought that through, but regardless of whether you did, that's what you're executing. And I think that is a brilliant strategy. The more inflation there is, the easier it is for me to pay off my debt. Because right. the more inflation there is, the more the cost of my services go up, the more cost of ad rates on YouTube go up, the more I get paid, the easier it is to pay the bills. It's uh, having, having that debt is uh, and, and that inflation protection, probably one of the top reasons to buy real estate and not rent. 
Yeah, for sure. So how do you go about getting a wedge deal? Because that's kind of your, your your claim to fame. I think I love the fact that you kind of trademarked it to a certain extent. I wasn't that creative. I would just say you make money on the buy side, but that, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of boring. But in essence, it's the same thing. So, so how do you, you know, if you had to give some advice to aspiring real estate investors, how would you tell them to do that? Because that is crucial. You have to make money on the buy side or get a wedge deal. That That's where you make all the money. It's not made when you sell. It's made when you buy. Yeah, exactly. That's that was actually I'm going to pull something up here that I could show. But that was one of my big beefs with uh, Grant Cardone is uh, he would always say, I don't care if I got to pay over market value. I uh, I'll be able to sell it to BlackRock for 30 percent more in a few years or whatever. Right. Okay, and, right. And, and that is that's probably it, it could potentially be true. Right. <laughs> you get some cash flow in the meantime, you get the principal pay down, you get the inflation protection. But, yeah, I mean, you you know, I'd, I'd much prefer to pay under market value for something. That's something I can't do in stocks. You know, when I buy Tesla or, or whatever stock I'm buying, I, I'm i paying market value in that moment of time. Yeah, when right. I buy a real estate deal under market value, I am buying something that I know is cheaper than it should be. And right. that's almost solely because uh, people are entirely clueless about construction. I want to point out that... Uh, ex- to what you were saying, uh, people have to realize that one of the benefits to real estate is it's a very inefficient market. Oh, God. Where if gold is trading at $2,000 an ounce, I can't get anyone to sell it to me for $1,500. It's not going to happen. And right. But with real estate, if you've got a house that's potentially, let's just say $200,000, if you find a motivated seller or if the, you're the first person they go to because you're you've got that local network, then you you can potentially get these deals. It's very hard to do it nowadays, but when the market goes maybe back down to reality or, or maybe back down to where it's uh, a little more of a seller's market or excuse me, a buyer's market, then uh, that those deals are are out there. And for my case, you know, I do most of my business overseas, and those wow. markets are wildly inefficient because they don't have an MLS. Eighty percent of the homes that are for sale aren't even online. It's just a matter wow. of a for sale sign in the window and you just have to walk around the neighborhood and knock on doors. So you can That's imagine nuts. how well you would do there with wedge deals. Yeah, no kidding. That's crazy. I did not know that. Yeah, the uh, that's something where, uh, let's see here if I could get this to go to full screen. I want to show it off here uh, or, or at least show it. But uh, that's one of the things is real estate becomes such a matter of becoming good at construction, becoming good at uh, construction, if I said that correctly, but also becoming good at negotiating with people and and convincing them that, hey, you're the best buyer. You know, sometimes people will go with uh, a buyer because they got the cutest family or the cute story or or they give a seller flexibility in a way that somebody else is. There's so many different reasons people uh, give away deals, I I always say. Uh, And it's, it's always a matter when you're negotiating real estate of finding what what are the pain points and how could you solve those while still making money? So I'll pull this up here. This uh, what I'm going to show here is uh, probably my favorite because we did it was a hoarder house, and uh, here we go. Dude, I, I, so, I, I've, I've bought so many of those. <laughs> oh, they're great, yeah. but you know when you go up to a property and it looks like this on the outside already, yeah, you already yeah. know that that you're looking at uh, at something with, with some potential here. But you go inside. What's hilarious is oh, when you go God. in yeah. and it's yeah. stinky and gross like this, yeah. most yeah. people come into a property like this and, and they think, oh my gosh, this is going to cost $150,000. Everything right. needs to be torn out. Everything's got to be redone. Things are stinky. They're gross. They're mildewy and all this. And, and people are so highly overvaluing what it's going to cost to clean this kitchen up, for example, here. Yeah, exactly. uh, so I look at a property like this. And I went in with a $50,000 budget. I ended up, as usual, spending 10% more, <laughs> spending $55,000. And so where the market thought I had to spend $150,000 remodeling this, I spent fifty. I ended up keeping the cabinets and painting them. Just change the hardware. Basically change the hardware and paint it, right? I'll, I'll show you the after as well. But yeah, yeah I mean, 
uh, you know, I could go in here, I could glaze the, the kitchen, I could throw all the stuff away, or not the kitchen, I could glaze the, the bathroom tile, make it all look like it's new white tile. And, and I'm able to take advantage of things where people don't even know what glazing is. People don't even know you could keep these cabinets. People don't know I could keep the doors. People don't look under the vanity when a house looks like this to determine, oh, it's got copper plumbing. Wow, they're dual pane windows. Nobody's looking at that. Mm -hmm. I am. That's where I'm making my money. <laughs> right. That, that's a fantastic example. And so many of the average Joes out there, they, they don't realize that you can get those types of deals because they think that everyone is just like them. And the, from the standpoint, they keep their house clean. They're, they're rational thinkers. They're not doing drugs. They're, they're not, uh, you know, they don't have all these crazy problems. And unfortunately, uh, people are crazy. And <laughs> you, you get some situations that you could not even fathom. And if you're someone there that's uh, that's able to provide liquidity, you, you can get some of those smoking deals. Do you have any of the after pictures? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, it's it's so funny what you're saying. I mean, even just when sometimes I'll hear like people are like, oh, I uh, I got a multifamily building. The rents are 300 bucks and I was able to raise them to, to 700. I'm thinking to myself, how how does that seller not understand? what the rental market is it's probably because they're, they managed they're, themselves they haven't raised rents in 20 years they're just sick of tenants and toilets they don't want to raise the rents because they're worried about a tenant potentially leaving causing more work for them and uh and, and that lets somebody else create an amazing or, or get an amazing deal so yeah. yeah people do things irrationally and that's what you get to arbitrage basically yeah well it's so, great great look at that unbelievable yeah this and then here's the kitchen same cabinets whoa <laughs> uh, you yeah. can see these are the same original wood cabinets here uh and uh, so yet yeah, to me i mean uh it's, it's just a no-brainer and it's simple you know i don't have to go in and do do crazy things i mean floor paint baseboards uh you know we paint paint goes so far i mean look at this this was that same green tiling you saw earlier i hadn't put the plumbing in yet but mm. when i scanned it but anyway yeah yeah this is just incredible and it's so, I mean, uh, changing the floors or what, it just really makes it pop. It's it's just, just getting the stuff out of there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can even go outside. You know, oh, I try to keep wow, it something simple backyard. in California. Uh, I do grass in the front and in the back, I just try to clean it up and keep it simple. I, should, I pressure wash that wall later. I scan too early, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so so simple, you know. That's right. So you go in, you get a deal that nobody wants or people are scared to touch. They won't even walk in the front door. I mean, 99% of people wouldn't even walk in that front door. And because what you're seeing right there, viewers, you're probably saying to yourself, oh my gosh, how could someone have a house in that condition? But trust me, it gets way worse than that if you were able to actually smell the house. See, I don't have yes. smell a vision right now on YouTube. If you could actually smell that house, trust me, it's 10 times worse than what you just saw. So, but it's, it's just a great example of buying something that's kind of unloved, fixing it up, forcing that appreciation, and then increasing your, your ROI uh, with that, that cash flow. Your cost basis is so much lower. And I'm sure you're able to get that deal because you're a local expert. I don't know if you found it that way, but you knew the comp, so you knew what you could spend. And then it's about managing people and solving problems that, you know, people always ask me about how to become a successful entrepreneur. I said, well, you gotta have ambition. You gotta be willing to sacrifice things that other people are not willing to sacrifice. You have to be able to manage people and you have to be able to solve problems. So, so you were able to kind of take all of those things, put them together and turn that into a fantastic rental property. Now, do you have a 30 year fixed rate loan on that one? Heck yeah, it's like 3.2 oh. or something like that. It's nuts. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so that's awesome. why I have such hesitation to like sell these because I, I don't know, maybe I'm just emotional about it, but I got a great loan. I had a great, I got a great deal in it. I don't want to deal with the 1031. Uh, you know, so I, uh, lately I, I've been looking at even around town here, I've been looking at 50 unit, you know, 70 unit buildings and I'm like, Oh man, I should just sell some stocks and buy that. But then, then maybe we want to talk about stocks too, but uh, you know, then, then you look at the stock market and it's like, well, but wait a minute, the stock market just went up 5% in a day. I'm not going to make that in cash flow on that big building, <laughs> you know? So sometimes I'm like, wait, why would I sell stocks to go back? I, 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 I'm torn right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there's, it's, it's a crazy world. There's a lot going on, but that's uh, such an awesome insight. I'm so glad 
you're able to pull that up. So I, I know we're probably running short on time, buddy, and you've got another five videos to put out today. And so, <laughs> but I want to get your take on a few macro stuff here. Well, yes. Number one, I, I want to ask you if you think that stimulus, these stimulus checks, because you do so many videos on them, do you think this is something that's temporary? Or I mean, do you see this maybe being permanent in the form of like UBI or something that like Andrew Yang was proposing? This is definitely a step in the direction of UBI. I, I actually personally think that California, for example, could fix a lot of their crap if they did a universal basic income because they've got, you know, 33% of people are on Medi-Cal out here in California, which means they can't afford their own health care and, and, and they're getting subsidized. Uh, if, if California had a universal basic income uh, of 500000 bucks, something like that, but then you got rid of, in, you know, uh, Medi-Cal and, and um, you know, welfare and all of these other programs that exist, I believe you would be net up money and uh, <laughs> you could spend that money on better schooling and better education to actually teach people how not to be dependent on the government and, and uh, build their wealth. Now, well, that's not Friedman's go proposal, in. Kevin. I don't it's know a, if you, I don't know if you studied that, but that was Milton Friedman's proposal. Oh, for perfect. Universal, basically, because he just was thought, let's just get the government out of it. Let's get all the bureaucracy, the red tape. We'll save that money and just send everyone a check for, let's say, a thousand dollars. I, and I'm oversimplifying it there. Sure. But yeah, that that was kind of Friedman's argument. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's difficult because, you know, then, then you wonder, okay, shouldn't there be like strings attached or whatever, you know, who knows, maybe like there's an education requirement or like a trade school education requirement, which we should have much more trade school than like algebra teaching. In my opinion, for most yeah. people, it's like, let's learn how to be an agent. Let's learn sales. Let's learn investing. Why aren't we learning that stuff in schools compared to sure. the BS they make us, they make us learn big problems. It's going to take decades to change these things if it ever changes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the government is so terribly bureaucratic and I think that's, that's true, whether it's, uh, the federal government or local government or whatever. It, it, and that's just almost by design because there's so many layers and steps you have to go through, but it's so inefficient. It, it's garbage in my opinion. Yeah. But, the, my yeah, my but, thing with, with Yang's proposal is he, he wanted to not replace welfare, but he wanted in addition. to be in addition to it. So you don't have yeah. any of the, the benefit there. It, it, and that that it's um it's definitely politically very divisive. Yeah, right. uh, I will say if if you have UBI, in theory, you eliminate poverty instantly. Which, if you're in poverty, you're two and a half times as likely to commit crime. So if people all of a sudden are elevated out of poverty, do you now get this massive societal benefit by having less crime, which probably saves the economy money in some way, right? So. It, it's interesting, you know. It just hasn't been tried in in America, where we do have a where we do have a poverty and a poverty problem, a hunger problem. We, we've got some serious issues in the country. You know? Yeah, my concern is is would be going back to inflation, and it would be the distortions yeah. that it creates with malinvestment and a misallocation right. of resources. And you're 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 kind of paying people to not work. So there's there's a lot of right. moving parts there. I, I don't want to get too far into that though. Um, opinions on Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah. So I. Uh, I was not drunk, but people made fun of me as if I was drunk because of the way I was <laughs> acting on a live stream the other day. I, uh, quote unquote, drunk purchased three Bitcoin <laughs> the other day at, <laughs> at like uh, $35,000. And uh, yeah, I mean, the first day it was down like three grand. And I'm like, that's what I get, you know. Right, but now right. it's like, I don't know, this morning it was up like $17,000. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's nuts, man. What do you think? I think... And I've said this for the last year. I think Bitcoin's a great speculation. I like to set up my portfolio in something I call a 10-80-10. So 10% allocated to insurance, which I think is physical gold. 80% would be investments, which I define as things that pay me to own them. And another 10% is a speculative asset, which, which means I just think that they're going to go up in price because there's good asymmetry. So Bitcoin for me fell into that bucket. I yeah. think there's a, a, a a relatively high probability it goes to 100,000 over time. Short term, mm -hmm. I'm a little worried just because going back to the emotion in the markets we talked about with Jim Rogers, you, you, is it a little bit more of a, a mania or is it more of a hysteria now than it is a panic? 
Maybe, but but again, I want to be clear. Long term, I'm very bullish. Think it, it, there's a good probability it can get to a hundred thousand, regardless of what it does a short term. Now, whether it goes there in a direct line or not, uh, it'll be fun to to watch and find out. Because I actually own Bitcoin, but I'm not buying any more right now. Now, but those people, there's other people that would argue that there's also a, a, an equally high probability that Bitcoin is going to replace fiat currency or replace the dollar as mm. global money and it's going to replace the euro dollar system and basically the global monetary system as we know it wow. so it's not only a store of value uh, but it's also uh, you know we're using it for transactions and every country is using bitcoin from a tra transactional standpoint we're, we're lending against bitcoin we're you know doing all these things that i i see as a much lower uh mm. probability that's kind of my yeah, because then you wouldn't be able to uh essentially print money anymore because there's a finite supply. Yeah, see, that that's that's a great point. And that one of Bitcoin's, uh, you know, biggest attributes is that it's scarce. It's a right. scarce resource. That's why people see it as such a, a great uh, potential long-term store of value. But then you say, okay, well, how do you lend against that? And people say, okay, well, you just use full reserve banking. So that was prior to us even creating fractional reserve banking or or free banking as which we had back in the United States in the early uh, 1800s before the Civil War. But so that's where you're basically, you take your gold coin, you give it to the bank, and then they take that and put it into a, a time deposit, and then they lend that actual gold, gold coin out to someone else. That's full reserve banking, right? But in right. fractional reserve, you're basically taking that, you're creating an IOU from another gold coin, or in this case, it would be an IOU for another Bitcoin. So you're creating additional Bitcoin kind of purchasing power. So that kind of takes us back to where we are now with kind of, or where we it were. becomes fiat. Yeah, yeah to, to a certain extent, you know. So kind of where do you draw the line if you have a money supply that's not elastic and can't expand with the demand for productive lending. And that's kind of where it gets a little a little murky. So so that's my that's my opinion on it. What what do you think about um, US going negative as far as the negative interest rate? Do you see that as a, a high probability or do you see that kind of no chance or what do you think? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I want to quickly add just on on uh, finishing up the Bitcoin there. I think what'll be very interesting to watch in the short term is what happens when the CPI data comes out, as much as people hate the CPI data, when that data comes out for March and April, which will come right. out in April and May, because we're going to see year-over-year -year inflation of over 3%. You think? And, okay. well, well, we will because uh, of, of the dip that we had last March. We had okay. such uh, – the consumer price index went down to I think it was 255 at its low. Right now it's at 262. You know, by March, April, it'll be 265, you know, little nominal movements up. Well, when we divide these into each other, we get three to three and a half percent. So we'll have that year over year inflation reading, but it'll be artificial because it'll be looking back into a dip, basically. Right. OK, got it. I wonder how much mainstream media, basically clickbait there is going to be like seriously, CNBC, Fox, CNN. I, I wonder how the story will get spun about, right. oh, my gosh, inflation year over year is three and a half percent. Something right. like that. I personally think there is a chance that that could lead people to freak out, dump everything they own into Bitcoin. Yeah, but right. But then the, here's where the danger comes in. Once people realize that, wait a minute, we were just reflecting back to the dip, and then we do a year over year comparison from June, the inflation's back to 1%, you know, 1.3% or whatever, that could quickly reverse. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay, so I mean, kind of on that inflation note, what do you think about negative interest rates? If we see inflation or inflation expectations, let's say, yeah. uh, increasing, I, I know we've seen the 10 year, I, it sounds funny to say, but it, it's gone up dramatically, up over yeah. 1%. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah. You know? No, but it's the first time it's gone over 1% since March, so it was a big day. Yeah, uh, inflation expectations have gone up. I, uh, I think that our country is potentially at risk of following a very European model, and that is we're going to continue to see deflation. Certainly, we have technological deflationary pressures, but I would not be shocked if in the future, you know, we're like 3.25% on a 30-year, just got 2% or one9 you know, like that yeah. would not shock me long term.
you know, 10 years from now, wouldn't shock me. But will we go negative if we keep going in that direction? Yeah, eventually, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and there's some real smart macro guys that uh, would agree, maybe not on the negative side, but definitely lower interest rates. My good buddy, uh, Steve Van Meter, Jeff Snyder, uh, just to name a few. Okay. Wrapping things up, my friend, I want you to explain to the viewers right now uh, how you have been able to achieve what you've achieved, not just with your YouTube channel, but with real estate. Uh, you know, we walked through the whole story, starting out at Jamba Juice and becoming a, a real estate agent and then just keeping and parlaying and just working harder and harder and harder and harder. I can't even comprehend how many hours a week you work right now. But, but you've got a wonderful wife. You've got two very small children. So how do you do this? Because most people, they set up these roadblocks for themselves. They say, well, I could never do what Kevin did because I've got two small children. I could never do what Kevin did because I work a nine to five job. You can just fill in the blank, right? But you were able to do it. And I think, tell us how you, you kind of, was there a secret? I just want to, it's so inspirational that I, I want people to really uh, get a lot of value from, from your story to know that they can do it as well. If you can do it, if I can do it, they can do it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a broad answer and then the narrow answer. One of the narrow answers, which I think is just something practical that everyone can implement very quickly. And it helps me a lot is it's hilarious when, when I have nothing on my calendar in a day, ironically, sometimes I just don't get a lot done. Mm. But when I have an 11 a.m. call that I got to get on, right. uh, like, for example, this morning, uh, the couple two to three hours before that, it's just like, get everything done, get everything done. Like I'm compressing all this time into a shorter period of time because I have a deadline right. or Lauren says we're going on a run at four. OK, I got to sit now. I got to get this done now. When you have a deadline, whether it's self-imposed, I want to be with the family at five. I want to be with the family at six. You know, I plan to do this at seven. When you have these self-imposed deadlines, the, the, the your efficiency goes up extremely, <laughs> like exponentially almost, I would say. Right, right. That's sort of a, something that I think is, is easy to implement is, is having having those sort of commitment deadlines. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, the, it's it's kind of like you get an assignment in high school. You know, nobody ever does it until the day before, but all of a sudden you get it done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, similar principle, but then uh, zooming out more, it's all about trying to figure out wh what can you do to provide value. Uh, and an easy way that I can try to explain that, I think in, in a way that's much more relatable is let's say you're hanging out with, uh, you know, you're going for uh, beer and wings. You know, I used to do that with my father-in-law all the time before the lockdown. And, uh, sometimes we take other people along. What I found is you're sitting there with, let's say four guys, gals, whatever, everyone's sitting talking. You don't want to be that guy that walks up to that group and goes, hey, guys, oh, my gosh, this uh, and, and, and you're talking a bunch of gibberish. Like what you're saying is just annoying. That's you get a lot of that on clickbait or you get a lot of that on YouTube in the style of like clickbait with no substance. Right. right. That pisses people off at a bar that pisses people off on YouTube. If now you're like, you know, sitting there like. Hey, I've got this investing strategy. What do y'all think about this? And, you're, you, and, and you know, maybe maybe like, hey, you want to hear about my crazy 10x investing strategy? There's your clickbait. But then, all right, so here's my strategy. And it's actually good. Like you're actually providing value. People love that. You're and right. so I, anytime I make a video, I try to think of myself, would I talk to somebody about this over beer uh, and, and share these opinions? And, and, or, or would this be a waste of their time? Yeah, right. Okay, so the secret there is... I, I would say uh, know your strengths and your weaknesses first and foremost. And then once you understand how you operate, you're kind of your personality type and what those strengths and weaknesses are, try to set up a structure that allows you to be as productive as possible. Then make sure that you're adding value in whatever you're doing, whether it's a nine to five gig or something on YouTube, regardless, you're adding more value than you're extracting. Mm -hmm. Lastly, Okay, you're a 28 year old guy. You're a multi millionaire. You've got a wonderful family. You you you've got it all. So how do you stay motivated? I, I mean, what what what? You, why do you wake up in the morning? Like, why do you continue to do what you do? How do you keep that motivation, that drive to continue to improve and improve and improve? I think the only thing that 
I found that ever really answers that is it's almost like it's the pursuit of succeeding that's just addicting. It's not money. It, it, like it, it makes no difference. Uh, of course, it makes a difference at some thresholds, right? But uh, you know what the number is today compared to yesterday. That doesn't matter. What, what, what's exciting is seeing growth, uh, reaching more people, yeah. uh, providing more perspective and value, and then seeing people benefit from that. Uh, that's exciting, and, and that gets me to wake up every day and keep doing it. That's right. And that in and of itself is why we need to support entrepreneurs, small business, mid-sized business, and why we want an economy that's based on a bottoms-up approach instead of this central planning, government intervention, and, gov and intervention by the Fed. It all starts with the individual, and Meet Kevin is a fantastic example of that. All right, buddy, I have kept you way too long. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, really, I, I, you only gave me a half hour, 45 minutes, and we've gone well over. I sincerely appreciate your time. For my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? Oh, uh, meet Kevin on YouTube. <laughs> You see me every day. <laughs> Multiple times. That's right. And I would highly suggest it, guys. He really stays current. He does a lot of personal finance stuff, especially for the young guys and gals out there. He not only talks about what's going on with the government and the stimulus checks and real estate and the and a lot of the stocks that uh, young people are interested in, but he goes into you know what's the best credit card to use. And I know right now you're not hyper focused on that, but I'm sure you'll transition back into that. Um, when the when you feel as though the that your audience will receive value from that, it's going back to what we we're saying. So, thanks again, uh, Kevin. I cannot wait to do it again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Next time we'll talk about Chomspack. <laughs> Chomspacketh. <laughs> All right, my friend. Thank you.